Okay, uh, for this week's lecture, I'm actually going to give you some recommendations that I've given before publicly around prototyping for games. The whole idea here is that you've got one game under your belt, you've actually created uh, some interactive experience, and now the expectation is that you're going to push that, that practice a little further. So essentially, this lecture is less about uh, honing a specific skill and letting, giving you an opportunity to both reflect on what you learned from that first project and what you're going to do to sort of push it to the next prototyping level. So um, generally, this is given uh, both more context than what we had in the first project, where I really just wanted you to try anything uh, and also give you a sort of set of good uh, sort of best practices, rather, for um, doing this kind of work better. All right, so let's get started. So years ago, um, there was a, uh, the first sort of global game jam started. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with the global game jam, what basically happens is uh, worldwide over a single weekend, people create uh, video games, a variety of digital games, sometimes analog games as well. But the whole idea is that it's about trying to make something quickly and easily and something that is interesting without investing a whole lot of time. So you do it in 48 hours, you start on Friday, by Sunday you've got something playable. And that's the spirit of this course. It's sort of like game jamming, except what you're doing is you're given a longer space and so essentially what I'm going to do is give you some of the tips. Uh, for those of you who don't realize, I used to be vice president of the Global Game Jam, uh, and I've employed this in my own practice. So I'll give you all that context and uh, help you understand how you're going to do your second project more effectively. So back in 2009, uh, we had the keynote for the Global Game Jam was a, a, a man named Kyle Gabler. Uh, Kyle Gabler actually had come from a, something called the Experimental Gameplay Project at Carnegie Mellon University. So this is back in 2008 or so. And the Experimental, game, Experimental Gameplay Project had a couple of core concepts. Uh, first, the idea was that uh, the grad students who were participating in this project had to make games in less than seven days. All of those games had to be made by just one person, and the games also had to be based around a specific theme. So that theme one week might be gravity, or vegetation, or swarms. And the projects that came out of the very first, well, the very first experimental gameplay project were quite interesting. They were games that other people wanted to play. One of the projects that came out of it, uh, and you can see it at the lower left hand or lower right hand corner last row, is this Tower of Goo. Tower of Goo was the prototype for a game called World of Goo. World of Goo was actually uh, released on various platforms, and its original prototype was developed by Kyle Gabler as part of the Experimental Gameplay Project. So this well-received game was really generated over what is effectively seven days. Its core was seven days. There's a whole lot of other work that goes on after you've developed that prototype. But in this class, the focus is just on generating really interesting ideas that are worth pushing further. So um, the uh, article that I have you guys read, How to Prototype a Game in Under Seven Days, explores their lessons learned in the Experimental Gameplay Project. But you can kind of think of the Experimental Gameplay Project as uh, uh, a way of framing the work that you're going to do in more like three to four week sprints uh, with the expectation that you may not have the coding ability. But when they were doing this, they were developing them from scratch. They were students with enough programming skill to be able to execute it. And to give you some perspective, uh, I actually use the Experimental Gameplay Project for my own, or its, its tenets, its ideas, for my own creative practice. So years ago, I created something called Critical Gameplay, which was a series of art games, and I gave myself similar uh, restrictions. So the whole idea behind my project was that I was creating 14 games that remind people how to play differently. So um, for my restrictions, what I did for myself is I said that every game must be made in less than seven days. Each game had to be made exactly by one person. Obviously, that one person was me. And each game had to crit critique common game mechanics. And that was the way I came up with a sort of theme. The theme was I would look at something like first-person shooters, or I'd look at action games, and I'd say, what aren't we doing that maybe we should be doing? 
So um, all these games are made in less than seven days. I have a variety of them. You can check my website for uh, the different experiences, and I'll talk a little more during this presentation, but I just wanted to give you context. Now, the interesting thing about that is that many of those games ended up being games that I exhibited in a variety of showcases and exhibits around the world. So um, there was a lot of sort of, um, as you'd say, sort of press and respect that I got from these very simple games that I made in seven weeks. So I showed them in places like Singapore and, and um, galleries everywhere from Madison to New York. And the whole idea was that I was trying to make really interesting gameplay. And I think one of the most uh, surprising things to me was that one of those games, one of those games I developed in seven days, actually won a Games for Change award back in 2013. It was considered one of the 10 best social impact games of the last decade. So it's just to help you understand how much potential these little projects that you're doing can be. Now recognizing that um, even at that point I may have had more experience than you are in developing games, I'd like to give you uh, a sense for the potential of your work. So you're not thinking of it just as an assignment, you're thinking of it as something that might, like my work, win you awards and recognition. So here's a couple of awards that I've won. Now if you're not interested in the art side, the other way you can think about this is that I built a, um, a little game company called Mind Toggle Software for years that employed the same restriction. I built the games very quickly and I tried to play off the same things that I had within Critical Gameplay. So basically Mind Toggle is my commercial version of the Critical Gameplay games. And some of those games like Black Like Me, I'm um, shown sort of uh, stats shown here, ended up doing pretty well on the App Store. Uh, another game that was much more sort of action um, uh, oriented did the same, uh, ended up as a top 100 in Denmark and South Korean markets. And then uh, I had a couple of games that ended up in sort of like the top 100 arcade. And all an and, and arcade and action. And all of these games were made very um, simply and very quickly. None of them took more than seven days. Uh, and I made the art, I did the um, code, which I did uh, in a very simple language, uh, a visual programming language like you'll be using. And I also, um, I, I really just kind of had fun doing it. It was a fun little side project amongst my other responsibilities. So all of those games were made with Game Salad, which is why I'm recommending it here as a tool that you use. So um, you're gonna be able to build these games in more time than I had. That's the way I'm kind of leveling the playing field for you. And honestly, I made those games 10 plus years ago when there were far fewer resources than there are now. So the whole point of this lecture is actually to help you understand how to make a great playful experience. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you basically how you make games in under seven days. And you might be asking yourself, how do I do that? Uh, you may have a little experience in doing it uh, from your first project. And so I'm going to just kind of set it up for you here. Uh, I think that there's sort of a multiple choice question here. So you might think the best way to make um, a great game in seven days is to perhaps master development design and art. Or maybe answer B is let go of all of your anxiety and just make a game. Or answer C might be steal the content and pass it off as your own. Given that I'm an academic and that I'm certainly not going to encourage you to steal anything, uh, you can guess that C is the wrong answer, but you may be surprised to find out that B is the right answer. This isn't about mastery of skill, it's about just trying to make the best experience you can. So this Making Quick Prototypes 101 is specifically focused on that. And realistically, the, the process is much more about the mindset than it is about uh, specific technical skills. I'm going to give you a bunch of shortcuts. And these shortcuts apply whether or not maybe you're building a game in Twine, and realistically, all the way up to something like uh, Unity. So the first tip is to think small. So when I say think small, what I'm really trying to encourage you to do is think small concepts uh, like really simple ideas that can be that can blossom into something big so it's easy to execute but has a lot of potential this is basically often an algorithmic or puzzle game so I'll give you an example home improvisation is a game jam game and it's a really simple concept they give you things to put together but they don't take give you the instructions so it's a kind of physics puzzle with an interesting scenario that's an example of the kind of puzzle game that I think works very well in this context the idea behind these sorts of puzzle games is that they're repeatable and scalable. So if you want to frame them as a concept, think of them as Legos. So you're building a good Lego set within whatever environment, so likely game salad, and then what you're going to do is you're just going to scale those up. So these two pieces fit really well together. I'm going to repeat over and over again and make a full game out of it. The next thing to do, and this is definitely on mindset, is to think of this as practice. 
One of the things that I frequently see is that it can be exhausting, scary, daunting to just start this kind of project uh, by thinking of it as the ultimate project, as the only chance you have to do this kind of work. And so what I say is, is I often emphasize that you don't par paralyze yourself by thinking perfection, you think practice. So practice involves falling on your face. It involves um, falling frequently. And that's okay when you know you're shooting for something that's really great. So you get yourself really excited about a concept that you're excited about and then recognize that this is practice towards that particular project. And realistically, all creative work is practice. So art is practiced just as doctors practice. So to give you context, I made 14 games for Critical Gameplay that I publicly display, but I actually had 10 plus games that I discarded, that I threw away because they just didn't work, or the more I built them, the more I realized I was going down a bad path. That's why it's called practice, not perfection. So you might look at this prototype, which is a game um, that has a really novel concept. The concept here is what would happen with billiards or pool if you knew exactly where the balls would go. So as you can see by those, um, the lighter circles here, uh, you have a cue ball, the white ball, you hit it, and the red, blue, and black balls go where they may. But depending on the angle you hit it, you'll actually know what's gonna happen. So the idea here, this was called Oracle Billiards, is not that you um, are playing to the physical characteristics, the 2D simulation of physics that happens in many pool games. Instead, it becomes a strategy game where you already know where the balls are going to go and you're trying to optimize the experience. This particular version, it's a really interesting idea, uh, was a predecessor to a game called Braid. Braid is famous in the independent game circle. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, the, you can always look it up. But one of the easy ways to think about it is that this Oracle Billiards concept becomes Braid and Braid becomes a game that netted more than $6 million in sales. It was an absolutely brilliant game in its day and it involved um, seeing the future but playing as, as a platformer. So look up Braid, you'll get a little more context for it. Or you could look at other games like Journey, uh, made by that game company. And in some ways, the work that the that game company had done uh, to get to Journey was they created lots of games that were kind of iterations on grander and grander themes, trying to pursue this notion of flow um, through different mechanics. And so this game won lots of awards. Uh, it was recognized back in 2012 as one of the best games of the year. And it was done by a relatively small team but you have to recognize that that particular game was also built with a very basic mechanic in mind. So on the right hand side, uh, you can actually see one of their first prototypes. And this photo prototype was about exploring a way for two players to work cooperatively in a kind of maze game where what we're trying to figure out is how one player finds the other. So you can see those little bits of sort of um, like light lines, that gray line, that's sort of a trail. And in this prototype, they were testing this idea of of getting two players to find each other in a, an unknown space by following the trail of another. So keep this in mind as you think about prototyping. Now, I'm gonna warn you that in every project you do, you're gonna have to add realistically about 30% to your timeline. So if you think it's only gonna take you three hours to implement something, add another hour. I guarantee it's going to slip. You might think you're really close and then something's gonna come up. It's always this way. Uh, I don't know any project that I've ever been involved with that didn't take more time than I expected. So everything's going to take longer than you think, and it's often going to be for reasons you never expect. So allocate enough blocks of time, long periods of time to do this work. Don't sit down and say, I'm going to finish this in an hour, because you won't get very far. It might take you 15 to 20 minutes just to set things up or to figure out what's going on. Number four, don't get hung up. And what I mean by this is don't just stick on one thing and get frustrated because that one thing doesn't work. Uh, it's kind of fun history. Uh, the tool Slack, for example, was not designed as a kind of uh, collaboration tool in the way that it's used now, but it was sort of discovered to be such from within a game company. And that kind of adaptive thinking is the way that you are going to succeed. 
You might start with a billiards game and end up with a volleyball game. That is perfectly appropriate. In this kind of design, you're not thinking about an end product for a user. What you're trying to do is think more creatively about a good experience, a playful experience that's worth continuing. Because you're not thinking about a design spec. It's not that your client has come to you and said, I need a great billiards game. What they've done instead is they said, I need something interesting. And when I say hang in there, I mean you really need to get used to not just sort of clinging to your one idea, but reading the environment. When someone plays your game and they like a feature that you didn't think was that interesting and that's the only feature they're interested in, you need to recognize when you need to move on. Likewise, as you're struggling with some challenges, if a feature isn't working that you're trying to get, move on to the next feature. Generally, what you want to do is give yourself time to come back to whatever you're working on uh, and then you'll recognize uh, later what's most valuable and what's not. As an example, time and time again, people who are new to this work start with a title screen. That should be the last thing you work on. I don't care about your awesome game until your awesome game works. So start from the inside out. The analogy is you start with the meat and then you season it. What are you going to cook? What's the core of the game? And then develop outward from there. Don't develop from the first experience forward. So for example, if you are doing a platformer, then you're going to start with the platformer mechanics, which often have already been made for you in a template. And then you're going to edit and revise that template. Likewise, you're starting with, uh, I don't know, a pinball game. Make sure you have the functions, the core functions of pinball working for first, and then move from there. Do not start with art. This is another way that people get hung up. They're worried about having something really beautiful, and the reality is we play games. We don't look at them. So start again with the meat, the most important stuff. So I always encourage you to start making your game with squares and circles, and then you can drop the art in later. Maybe you're gonna make the art yourself, so you give yourself some time to do it. Maybe you're gonna use a resource and then let uh, people know that you've used another resource. There are plenty of repositories of art, and you'd be surprised how far you can get with just some good squares and circles. Next, this is kind of a programming term, but essentially what you want to do is apply the shortest path algorithm. What that really means is you're gonna hack this thing together. You're trying to get something functional as quickly as possible. That's the secret to prototyping. Prototypes in the real world might be made of wood, even though the end product is going to be made of some carbon steel. Um, the prototype rocket may be a really scaled down version of it uh, so that we can test its aerodynamics, but we know we're going to throw that thing away. So remember that when you're doing this work, you're not building Notre Dame, you're not building something beautiful. Instead, you're building something disposable. So this is actually an image from uh, the Red Bull flying um, contest where people make these ridiculous machines, drop them off a tall building, and then the, the, the sort of novelty is in seeing how far they go. That's sort of the way you're going to think about it. So think disposable, but think spectacular things that are really interesting to see. Because the idea here is to make a big splash, make something that's worth scaling up. And the way I frame it is you're basically looking at a low investment, high impact experience. If you make another pinball game, it's got to do something that other pinball games haven't. If you make another platformer, what one thing or 10 things are you doing that other platform games have not done? So if you have a particular bias towards games, maybe you played a lot of, I don't know, match three games like Candy Crush or you've, um, you're really into choose your adventure games, you might want to start from there and say, what do you wish existed that didn't? What do you think there should be more of? So when it comes time to actually produce art or your quote unquote code, I encourage that you scale them. So as an example, in the art world, when I made Black White, which is one of the critical game, uh, gameplay games, what I did was I made a two-frame sprite, and I just needed a mouth. So I made this, there's just two frames to this animation. There's sort of open mouth and closed mouth. There's a smile and a non-smile. And I reused these images. Ultimately, it took me 20 minutes to make this art, because it's extremely simple art. 
When I made Penguin Roll, which was a game that I offered on iOS for several years, I actually started by 3D modeling and I was really, like I had this really intense aesthetic that I was going for and I realized I was going in the wrong direction. Simple was the right way to go. So if you look at this particular character, it's actually quite simple. It's a circle with a couple of circles in the center and that's the penguin. I'm not even sure you'd recognize it as a penguin if you actually knew, um, if I didn't tell you the game was called Penguin Roll. But that's okay, for this kind of design, works well. Another example, that game that I mentioned earlier that actually won uh, an award at Games for Change, it's largely algorithmic effects. So it is what we call billboarded grass and then a bunch of alpha or um, transparency effects. So I didn't have to do a lot of art making to actually make an interesting and aesthetically engaging experience. So try not to work a lot on high quality art when you're not even sure if the game's gonna work. And always be willing to let it go. I let this aesthetic go, this 3D shiny version of the game, um, and it really did help me out. Because rapid prototyping is about low investment and high impact. So again, let it go. As an example, I've discarded countless games that I, I went pretty far on and then said, oh no, this just isn't gonna work. I created some game about um, uh, insurance in the US and uh, ended up saying there really wasn't much more I could do with it. I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. Uh, I created a game about a wrecking ball destroying the world and threw that one away and created a game that in, involved uh, managing schools of fish in 3D and I spent a lot of time on it and then realized there, you know, it was a toy and the best part of the toy had already been created. I wasn't really gonna turn it into a game. I also had a game about aging that one ended up getting tossed uh, and sometimes to be honest with you with the aging game I just got so caught up in the aesthetics and the art that I, I just I lost track of the game I was trying to create couldn't create it in seven days and threw it away I had a rhythm game that I started and you can see this is a good example of just using different squares I had no aesthetic for this I was just trying to create an interesting rhythm game and at the end of the day I threw it away and I've thrown away lots and lots of assets, which is why I tell you don't make the art until you're ready that you like the rest of the game. Now some of the hard talk. So when you work on this kind of work, you're going to hate it at some point. It's just gonna be hard. It's like a long road trip where you might later remember all the best parts of that road trip, but there were times when you were falling asleep or you were grumpy or you were tired. That's life, that's how things work. So I found, and you can hear this amongst other indie game designers and developers, that it's often useful to work until you hate it, and then take a break until you love it again. You are gonna work yourself. It's gonna be hard at times. If it's not hard, then you're not doing enough. But what you learn to do is get to a point where you love it again. You get past that thing and it feels great. You don't run a marathon without you know, pushing yourself hard. But by pushing yourself hard, you actually grow and you get better because that's how you practice. You don't learn any sport, you don't learn anything of this type without some real challenge. So embrace that challenge, but make sure that you're not hurting yourself. So don't try to stay up 24 hours to finish the game, but do let yourself take on a full challenge and really dedicate yourself to it. Um, this is probably not from Ernest Hemingway, but it's a, a good example of the kind of thinking you should embrace, which is to recognize that the first draft of anything isn't going to be very good. So don't be too critical of yourself when what you produced isn't awesome. And if you are being less than critical of yourself, there's always an opportunity for improvement. But again, let it go. Now, while there are lots of formal creative formulas, I'm going to tell you basically that this is what's going to happen when you try to produce prototypes at this at this pace. So you're going to start and it's going to be an iteration. It's going to be this kind of like circle over and over again. The circle starts with, all right, you're excited. You're ready to get this work done. Um, you have a plan. You're going to do it uh, and you're going to run home and, and you're going to feel really good. Then you're gonna sort of feel like, oh, this is hard. I think I can do it, but I'm noticing that there are many more challenges than I had expected up front. Then you're gonna get sad, or you're gonna get frustrated, or you're gonna get angry, and you're gonna feel like everything sucks. Um, but if you push past that, you're likely to feel really good again, 
and say this can be awesome. And this is true, I think, in a lot of creative disciplines, not just games. There are times when you think you're never gonna make it and then you do. And this is true of monumental, like monumental games, or rather monumental films like Tron um, to uh, a variety of other uh, very sort of influential media. People hit a moment where they don't think they can do it and then they push past that and they're able to do it. So it's basically going to be a cycle where uh, you're basically going to say, great, let's get to work. Oh, wow, this is becoming hard. Oh, my gosh, I'm really upset about this. I don't know if I can do it. To wait a minute, I can do it. Uh, and, you know, at points you're going to want to rely on your instructor to help you through this. At other points you may just, um, you need to take a walk and give yourself some perspective because a lot of times when it's feeling overwhelming, it's usually because you need to take a deep breath and go back. So I remind people that the nice thing about this cycle is it's better to do it in seven days than seven months or three years. And so some of those huge independent game hits were the product of this cycle repeatedly over two or three years. Uh, and so I think the best thing to do is try and pack that in a nice short time. Uh, all right, so you know, kind of turning to more uh, positive and more sort of lifestyle choices, I think one of the important things to do is to actually be efficient. And efficiency comes from a couple of really standard uh, approaches that I think people forget to do. So first is to comment your code. So anytime you're doing some work, make sure that you're taking some notes within the environment that help you understand uh, what you need, what you did and why you did that. At the same time, saving multiple versions of your project um, help you. So the idea here, and I'm using kind of technical terminology here, like a forked version, um, but essentially if you're working something like Game Salad, save a copy, and then save another copy, once you get it functioning in some way you like, save another copy under a new name. I usually just number them in increments, even if you're not using what we call version control software, where you're gonna check in a new copy every time. What you're gonna do is you might end up screwing up on your 10th iteration, and you might not know how to back out your changes. But if you've saved version nine, maybe you're calling it My Cool Game 9, then you will go back to My Cool Game 9 and start working on from that version. And then you can throw away My Cool version 10. That way you're not overwhelmed when you make some irreversible change. Likewise, I know it can be, it's a little thing, but I've seen a lot of people screw up here. They think they can power through on pile of Mountain Dew and pizza, and it just doesn't work that well. So I encourage you to kind of balance your food and eating, because what happens is you have these, you'll have the, you'll crash. I've seen it over and over again, and you think you'll be able to execute all this work, and then you just lose it. So please give yourself balance. And that balance includes taking a nap, um, or going for a walk because it'll help you clear your head. Doing something different, especially when you're not in front of a screen, will help you. What you have to do in this time that you have is actually allocate enough time that you can afford to go for a walk or take a nap. So don't wait till the last minute. And that, of course, includes reusing any content, art or code, as much as possible. So I'll give you an example from my own work. So these are two very different games. Big Huggin' on the left is my game where you control it with a giant teddy bear, and You, a very meaningful game on the right, is a game where you're basically a platformer trying to place the character, You, in sentences. And if you look at it carefully, you might say, wait, what's the reused art? Now if you look carefully, you should be able to see it. I'll give you a second or two to say, oh, I see what he's reusing. The reveal is, it's the water. I used the exact same water sprite I had used previously. So originally I built it for Big Huggin and said, ah, you know what, I have a similar aesthetic, I can reuse this water. Reuse is perfectly fine. It's a good, efficient way to get your prototype done. This is one of the reasons, for example, that I ask you to use templates. So efficiency in art is also about, quote unquote, refactoring art. What that means is that you can actually design the game so that you can change colors of items, for example, using code instead of creating an individual piece of art for all of your need. And a really good example of that is my Black Like Me game that I showed you previously. So if you look at this game, essentially it was a matching game where you can see the number in the upper left-hand corner is a timer, and once it comes down to zero, you're out of time, and you're looking for that
that color amongst the tiles at the bottom. So in the first one, you're looking for a hue of blue, and the next one, you're looking for a hue of green. And the interesting thing about the game is the longer you played, the more narrow the color field became so that you were trying to find shades of gray. So it became quite complex. But if you look at that carefully, there is a dominant piece of art that's actually very frequently used. So I only had to create the piece of art once, and then I could just let Game Salad do the rest of the work for me. And that's this one, what we call sprite, this one image. So this image functions as player input, as the in-game timer, as the icon for my pro and for my promo image. It's the start button, it's the tweet button at the end of the game, and it's my level select button. So that one thing, I just kept changing the color. It's very simple to do in most of these environments. You use a white sprite and then you just add tint. And so I was able to produce, this game really was like a three day enterprise at most. Uh, and it wasn't three days continuously, it was you know, three or four hours a day. Uh, and that way I could, I could reuse this art. It was a very efficient use. And you should try to try and practice efficient thinking in everything you do. Uh, try to identify easy solutions from hard solutions and execute the easy solutions. So efficient thinking is often about um, uh, an opportunity to create something from a complex idea. Uh, but not really good for tackling um, really codependent complexity. So things that are really complex that require six or seven dependencies. But one simple idea are really good for these kinds of projects. So I'll give you an example. This is one I often use at this point in the class. Uh, so verlets are this idea of creating kind of spring tension between two objects. And so it's the, um, it was a really like cool idea. Um, it's part of how people create what we call ragdoll physics in games. And this is really a simple concept. You have two objects and they must always maintain the same distance from each other, but given some inertia, they may get closer or further apart. Those verlets, as a common idea, spawn this charming little game called Sumatory Dreams, where you are a sumo wrestler. And I encourage you to just um, find a copy of the game or look on YouTube to see how it's played. And it's a really fun kind of party game where the characters are basically collections of 3D verlets. They're just cubes stacked together trying to fight each other. It's pretty funny. Um, and the physics are really the fun of the game. So it's a really simple idea. Create a verlet humanoid and then let people use them against each other. Another example is the series of games that keeps coming around stair dismount, which is the same concept. So what I'm trying to get you to do is employ a laser focus. Uh, generally people kind of talk about this as a kind of flow state to your work. So the flow state is actually something we frequently mention in games, so I can't ignore it here. Ideally, when we're developing a game, we want our players in a flow channel. That's basically the state between being very anxious because the game is too challenging and bored because the game requires too much skill. So when you design games, you want to try and do this, but as a designer, you also want to try and do this. So you want to make sure there is an appropriate amount of challenge given your skill level, but that you're not trying to bite off more than you can chew, as we say, or trying to do more than you're capable of after a little bit of challenge. So if you've never run before, no one would tell you to start with a marathon. They'd tell you try a 5K. In this case, or even try walking around the block. In this case, that's what you should be doing. You should be efficient and know your space between boredom, wow, this is really easy and I'm not building an interesting game, to anxious, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed and can't do anything. So you're gonna balance that and you want to balance that experience for the player. This is why, for example, most games ramp up. They increase their challenge as the player demonstrates that they have good skill. This is a really common way to design an interesting experience and we can talk about it more. Uh, when you'd like to. All right, so item nine is actually about creating the appropriate working environment. So um, it's going to be demanding and it's going to require that you have that laser focus I mentioned. So I sometimes recommend that people basically do some version of telling their friends that they're actually going on vacation when in reality they're staying home and working on a game instead. What that does, it leaves you the mental and physical space to actually finish your project or finish large portions of your project. So allocate large chunks of undivided time. This is not the kind of work like reading where you can pop in, do 20 minutes, and then walk out. If you do that, you will find that it's very hard to make progress. Instead, give yourself at least one to two hour chunks. Realistically, I think three or four hour chunks are the best way to go. 
Also, try and keep kind of a sterile environment without a lot of distractions. Don't leave the TV on. Don't like try and do two or three things at once. Don't even try to boil water while doing this because if you're in a flow state, you're gonna be so focused on the work that you're gonna end up burning that pot instead of boiling the water. So try and avoid distractions to support your own flow state as someone trying to be creative. And I also think it's important to give yourself a prize at the end. Now you might say that the grade's a prize, but I'm actually thinking more substantially than that. Uh, so when I did this work, I usually like went clubbing afterward and told myself that I've got, you know, I've got to do it until Saturday at 9 p.m. And on Saturday at 9 p.m. I'm going to head out and go do something fun. Uh, or, uh, you know, I'm going to go for a, a great swim or I used to like uh, race my cars so I'd go out for a great drive. All right, so number 10 is related to a great drive. And it's basically about employing reality checks. You need to check your current status towards your project frequently. So you need to look for caution cones. So I used to do a lot of um, autocross, which is basically uh, uh, sort of uh, car racing between cones. And so I want you to be critical of your progress. You need to know how to read the road in order to do it well, because you don't want to end up like this. And the way that Kyle Gabler exposes this concept in the reading um, seven way, or how to prototype a game in seven days is he says something a bit crass. He says, shoot your baby in the crib. What he's really saying is when you know that your project is going off the rails, that it might go off a cliff or that it's, it's going in the wrong direction, you need to stop there. And you might even need to stop the project entirely before this happens. So. Generally, you need to have a good toolkit to do this because you need to know how to adjust appropriately. And I generally suggest that you build with the simplest tool to get the job done. In this class, that's gonna be Game Salad. And with Game Salad, what I'm asking you to do is to create what we would call an MVP. That's a minimally viable product. Basically, the simplest thing you can do to test your idea and you might want to go past that MVP, but generally the MVP is the goal. So this is an example of an MVP. Um, this is one of the other MVPs for Journey. And in this one, they were looking at cooperation, another core element within Journey. And here they have what they describe as the fat guy and the skinny guy. And the fat guy has a lot of strength and the skinny guy has the ability to throw a rope. So they were playing with the mechanic to see if you could balance this. And these kinds of MVPs aren't exclusively made in Game Salad. They're made, this one is made in Game Maker. Um, other people use Construct 2. And I would generally suggest that you pick the tech after you set the goals, and I'm gonna teach this class with the expectation you're gonna use Game Salad. So another way to think about your tool set is to think this way. This is an awesome car. Uh, I love Ferraris, they're beautiful, they go fast, all this sort of stuff. But there's one problem with the average Ferrari, which is that when you have three people who wanna get somewhere, it's a problem. It's also a problem in the snow, because it's not designed for that. So Unity, for example, is a great product, but it's not the answer to every question, just as each of these individual tools is not the answer to every question. When you are trying to create an MVP, a minimal viable product, what I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to do is to find a general tool, which in the past has often been Game Maker, and currently I feel is Game Salad, uh, but in some ways, for some technologies, it may actually be a version of processing, and in other technologies, say VR, it might be Unity because it's a cost-effective and quick way to build virtual reality experiences and even augmented reality experiences. You can't do that with Game Salad, but you're not building that kind of tool, so I'm encouraging you to use Game Salad. And you think of it as a tool, as a Swiss army knife with a bunch of different things. Now, if you are um, cutting a steak, this is lousy. If you are building a house, this is lousy, but you're not doing either one of those. You are doing small tasks and you got, I'm basically teaching you a tool set, game salad, that lets you do a bunch of different things. It'll open bottles, it'll cut a twig, it will um, clean your nails, it'll let you open a wine bottle, blah, blah, blah. So um, as a review, uh, I basically just want you to recognize that there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, and so the, the core 10 lessons here is first to remember to start by letting go all of that anxiety you might have about doing this brand new thing and just make something. 
Um, second, you should think small. Think a small, repeatable experience that is novel and interesting, like that IKEA game where you are building IKEA furniture without the instructions. And then think practice. Um, it's okay to fail, just try and learn from the experience. Definitely add 30% or more to your timeline. If you start doing the work and you think it's gonna take 10 hours, it's gonna take longer. And don't get hung up. If a feature isn't working, move on to the next one. Try to hack it together. That's why I'm encouraging you to use templates. Uh, and scale your design. Start with something simple and manageable and then start making it bigger and bigger. Recognize that you're actually gonna work until you hate it but then take a break to love it again. Give yourself some time. And that time is part about, partly about being efficient. You will need to allocate both development time and break time to get this project done. Do not try to cram, do not try to do it at the last minute. It will fail. Likewise, create the appropriate environment for you to work the way you work best. Maybe that's with music, maybe that's not, but this is an opportunity on a small scale to figure out how to optimize your most intense and focused work. Next, employ reality checks frequently. Check your own progress, look at your goals, and say, am I moving towards those goals or have I got distracted? If you've gotten distracted, find out why you're getting distracted and fix it and fix it quickly. You don't wanna run off the road. If you said you were making a billiard game and all of a sudden this thing is looking like a platformer, you know you might be off the road. Now you have to be responsive. You may feel that you found a shortcut to a really interesting game, but you need to be responsible and often check your status. And then again, you're building with the simplest tool to get the job done. I always tell people to pick the tech after they've actually set their goals. So picking the tech in this context is pretty easy for you because your tech is gonna be game salad and it's going to be your Swiss army knife. So later in, the, um, in your experience trying to develop other playful experiences, you'll find that this kind of tool, a visual programming language, will actually serve you in lots of different ways. It's the kind of tool where you can build a functional prototype. Um, it's the kind of tool where you can play with physics or you can demonstrate something. Uh, it's really quite useful. So think of it as your, ar your Swiss Army knife uh, that you'll want to use over and over again after you have an idea. You don't just open a Swiss Army knife and say, what can I do with a bottle opener? You say, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to open a bottle? Am I trying to clean my nails? So think in those terms. And remember that the game salad is gonna give you a bunch of things. It's gonna give you some 2D physics. It's gonna give you the ability to store data in tables. It's gonna allow you to create a touch-enabled app, something you could play on an iPhone or, um, or an Android tablet. And it's going to also give you the ability to do some joypad stuff. So if you really wanna go traditional gamepad and you want someone to be able to play um, multiplayer, for example, it supports that and supports that easily. There are templates for it. So. Um, your tech is going to be game salad and you're going to use templates as a shortcut. There are a bunch of ready-mades, things that have already been produced, as I've mentioned before, ready-mades, that you can use as a jumping off point for your new and novel experience. Uh, so these might be things like simple physics that come from pinball games and you're going to do something totally different than a pinball game but you want that pinball feel um, or you want to do complex simulations there are some examples of that um, or more commonly just simple action games uh, using like what we call the beat em up um, experience so here you're sort of uh, I think Nintendo era 1986 kind of game but first, before you do anything, I want you to start with a toy and play. I want you to think about the kinds of experiences that you would have fun making. As a preview to the challenge, effectively, your challenge is going to be designing a playful experience that we have not seen before. With that, I encourage you to enjoy, um, take a break, look at some of the examples that I provided, go look up Braid, go look up um, uh, journey and uh, get some inspiration uh, and uh, sort of a breath of fresh air from all those examples. Hope that was useful. Thanks.